Hi and welcome to another newspaper article Lucky Dip episode with myself Jenny, my most beautiful of co-hosts and wearer of the hat, Yvette, and Elfie Boy is under the papazan this time around, so we may see him, he may make himself known. Let's lag this from you darling, thank you so much. Uh, for trigger warnings, I don't know. Um, I really don't know what's left. There can't be that many articles left. But I don't know what we're going to pull out of the hat, as always. So if you are a little bit sensitive to any scenario you can think of, look in the description below to see if it's come out the hat in this episode. Because these are just articles that have taken my, my notice while I've been researching other subjects so you could have anything so have a wee look in the description we'll get right into this one hello oh straight up in the pack is in now okay so initially we have the lincolnshire free press for the 13th of july 1897 we'll see what this lincolnshire paper has for us so we may have something of a sad article to begin us. This one is entitled Singular Death of a Child at Lincoln. And we'll have to get into it to find out the reason it skinned my attention. On Wednesday night, an inquest was held at the Portland Arms, Lincoln, on the body of a child named John Thomas Coulson, aged four, of 83 King Street whose death had resulted under most peculiar circumstances. On Monday evening, the child went out with its mother and when crossing over Tentercroft Street Bridge, stayed behind a little to watch a train. The child then started to run to catch its mother, but in so doing fell and a stick which it was carrying went right up the nostrils. The wound bled profusely for some time, but the child remained conscious and on Tuesday appeared to be going on well. About eight o'clock, however, worse symptoms manifested themselves and it was then evident the stick had penetrated the brain. At midnight, the child died. The jury returned a verdict of accidental death and expressed deep sympathy with the parents of the deceased. Yeah, I see why it caught my attention now. Oh. oh, that article makes me really uncomfortable. Oh, so, I mean, this could happen to anybody I guess um, this isn't something that was kind of this era specific you know uh, I think it's really why children are taught not to run with scissors etc isn't it because you don't want to stab yourself but what an unfortunate event that He's fallen and his hands, and you would think if a kid's running with a stick and he fell, maybe he dropped the stick instinctively to prevent his fall with his hands. Maybe just in falling the knock, his hand would knock the ground and that would knock the stick out of his hand. He's really unlucky to have fallen in a way where the stick's literally gone straight up his nose and apparently into his brain. Oh. It doesn't say anything about him having been brought to hospital. Yeah. They probably thought that it was just an injury to his nose. Maybe had the doctor pay something of a home visit just to check on him and make sure his cognitive faculties, as far as they could be tested, um, came back fine, maybe. 
but yeah, that that's just an accident, isn't it? Like it's just one of those things. <sighs> what a way to start. Nay, healthy boy. Don't run with things in your hands. Even as adults. Next up, we have hopefully something else more positive and upbeat uh, from the Edinburgh Evening Current for the 16th of June, 1832. We'll see what the Edinburgh Evening Current has for us. So the title of this one is interesting. I'm not entirely sure where it's going to lead us. Uh, we have Cockney Superstition Thames Police Office. On Wednesday, Eleanor Blucher, a tall masculine woman, a native of Prussia, who stated that she was distantly related to the late Field Marshal Blucher, was charged with beating Mary White, a young woman, the wife of a mechanic. The parties reside in the same court in Ratcliffe, and it appeared that Mrs White had recently lost several articles of value from her yard, and suspicion falling on the prisoner, she assembled a number of other women and they agreed to have recourse to the key and Bible to discover the thief. They placed the street door key on the 50th psalm, closed the sacred volume and fastened it very tightly with the garter of a female. The Bible and key were then suspended to a nail. The prisoner's name was then repeated three times by one of the women, while another recited the following words. If it turns to thee, thou art the thief, and we are all free. The incantation being concluded, the key turned, or the woman thought it did, and it was unanimously agreed upon that the prisoner was the thief, and it was accordingly given out in the neighbourhood that she had stolen two pairs of inexpressibles belonging to Mrs White's husband. The prisoner, hearing of this, proceeded to Mrs White's house and severely beat her and tore some of her hair out by the roots. She had since threatened her life and annoyed her in every possible manner. Mr. Ballantyne said this was the first time he had ever heard that a thief could be discovered by a key and a Bible. He was surprised that such superstition should exist in the British metropolis in the 19th century. Mrs. Blucher, who appeared a great virago, abused Mrs. White and said the neighbours were always turning the key upon her. Mrs. White said it always turned when Mrs. Blucher's name was mentioned and anything was lost. The key and the Bible were the sure way to discover a thief. Mr. Ballantyne said that the spell would be of great service to the police, who would be glad to avail themselves of it to discover felons. In brackets, we have laughter. All right. I mean, that's weird. And in which way would the key turn? So you're putting it in the Bible... But then closing it, fastening it closed, they're suspended to a nail, and then whoever you think it is, you say their name three times with that other verse. How, how do you know that it's turned to a person? You've got a book, and... You put a key inside it and bind it, and then suspend it. I mean, it, it might turn, but is it if the spine is facing you? If the opening is facing you? Uh, is it maybe the front or the back? Does it depend on how the key was put in and which way up it, it is? I don't know. They could have gone into more detail on that one, I think. I like the two pairs of inexpressibles. I assume that's underwear of some description. Um, belonging to her husband, so maybe long johns or something have gone missing. I, I, I've never heard of this. There was... Um, I don't even know what country, never mind who enacted this way of discovering a person, but was it murder or theft 
that there's a crime being committed and all of the house staff are told that they've got to go in and handle a chicken and that they'll know afterwards who was the guilty party and the chicken has been dusted with like black I think so they're going in and they would like try and catch the the chicken and they'd come out and the hands would be black but the guilty person went in and stayed away from the chicken because he didn't want the chicken to give him away um but instead the staying away of the from the chicken gave him away because his hands weren't black um don't know about this particular cockney superstition. I don't know how long it lasted. Um, And if you're saying the name of the culprit three times, you've already got a suspicion that it is a person. So you're really just trying to make the, the outcome fit that assertion, you know, that it, oh yeah, it was that guy. It's like, the spine of the book was facing him or what have you, you know. Um, it sounds like Mrs. Blucher probably just had a bit of a hard time of it. She's German and perhaps her neighbours were born and bred uh, Cockneys and maybe they just were quite happy to, to tar her with whatever suspicions they have over purely just on the basis that she was foreign. I mean, that's it's fairly likely. It certainly doesn't say afterwards whether it was found that, yes, yeah, she had been stealing things. Maybe check her house, you know, have the police see if they can find any of the belongings that were supposedly stolen. Um, We'll have this as a last one, because uh, that article is a wee bit long. We have the Fife Herald for the 3rd of October, 1861. We'll see what the Fife Herald has for us. So I might know what this article contains just based on the title. I think this is one of the articles that I actually took a screenshot of and shared on my socials. Um, we'll see if it's the one I'm thinking of. We'll get into it. It's entitled The Ex-Queen of Naples. Riding a few days since in the Campania, I was passed by three equestrians, two certainly men, the third a puzzle, but seeming rather of the epicene or doubtful gender. It wore a yellow zonave jacket, a black garment beyond description clothed its lower members, and on its head was jauntily stuck a bersaglier hat, with a great plume of yellow and black feathers. It rode like a woman, that is, very fast and recklessly, to the evident terror and suffering of its two companions, who, dressed in tight suits of black, and one at least with his feet thrust into his stirrups the wrong way, were tempting providence in a trot, a wide ditch was before them. I have seen men turn from a smaller. It, however, went straight at it and got well over, and turning around and taking off her hat to her pounded companions, there was the beautiful face of the ex-queen of Naples, who stopped to light her cigar while the two men went ignominiously around by the bridge. I like her. I like that she's out doing the lads, uh, despite her assumedly kind of closeted upbringing. Uh, these royals tended to not have great childhoods. Um, they were brought up to to have certain habits and um, their lives were a bit more restricted than the, the street wains of the era. So she's been brought up in this very kind of restricted way. She's obviously married well, royally, being a queen of Naples. And 
she's decided to stick a finger up at every day and go, mm, no, I'm going to live life how I want to. Um, she's showing up the lads by jumping over ditches that they're not planning on on even attempting. And then just to, to celebrate, she's felt like she's got enough time to light up a cigar while waiting for them to, to join her again. Yeah, that was the article that, that I had thought it was going to be. Um, it's nice to, to read it again. Uh, I like this person. Um, I don't know much about her. Uh, I assume this was when Naples, well, when Italy was still divided into its regalities. Um, so when they're calling her ex-Queen of Naples, I don't know that she would have been considered an actual queen. Um, I think it was more like earls, like or the earl equivalent in, in Italy um, that would kind of take on the, the authority of a, a region of an area. Um, I don't know what happened to make her an ex-queen. Uh, maybe her husband was ousted in some way. But uh, I like that wee anecdote about her. So yeah, I'll need to go and look up a wee bit more <laughs> about this this queen. It doesn't even say her name, does it? It just literally just calls her the ex queen of Naples, um, and it. So well, there you go. So that's not a terrible way to end. Uh, not a great start, but. Couple of interesting articles there to to follow up with, so I'm into it, and we may see you again for the next one. Take care.